All right, what's up guys? Today we're gonna to be talking about how to set up a Raspberry Pi as a full-blown NAS using Open Media Vault. This is gonna be a full setup tutorial going all the way from installing Raspbian on the SD card all the way into setting up smart tests on Open Media Vault. The best part about the setup is you never need to plug in a keyboard, mouse, or monitor into your Raspberry Pi. It's a totally headless setup. Open Media Vault is a great web-based GUI for creating a NAS, and it's totally free and runs on Linux, and it'll even run on the Raspberry Pi. Now, I've shown in other tutorials how to use a Raspberry Pi as a simple Samba server. However, Open Media Vault creates a Raspberry Pi that is truly a NAS. It has a really easy to use web interface, so all you have to do to control it is go on any browser on your network and you can start configuring it. It's also got features like smart tests and things like that and makes adding users really easy. So I also just recently set up Amazon affiliate links. So everything I'm talking about, I'm gonna be putting an Amazon link in the description. And if you click that link and buy something, I actually get a little piece of money. So go ahead and check those out if you're interested in setting this up. I'm also gonna be putting the hard drives I would actually recommend using. Right now I'm just using two SSDs for the demo, but honestly for this demo, it's complete overkill. And for the same price, you can get some huge hard drives with basically the same performance as realistically, our Raspberry Pi is gonna be what's slowing us down. All right, so for this demo, I'm doing everything on my Mac, but everything still should work on a PC. It's just for the SSH parts, you're going to have to download Putty, which is free software that allows you to SSH from a Windows PC into a Linux or Unix environment. All right, and so before we get started, I'll go over the hardware required to set this up. I'm gonna be using a Raspberry Pi 4, which has a true gigabit connection and two USB 3 ports. And so for a home NAS, it's gonna give us the best possible performance. The model I bought is the one gig model of RAM because when I was buying it, the two and four were out. However, having more RAM is definitely gonna help you out if you're looking for speed here. So if you can splurge the extra 20 bucks to get the four gig model, it's not a bad upgrade. So the next thing you're gonna need is the regular SD card and power supply. I'll just go ahead and link those down below. And finally, the hard drives. For this demo, I'm using these two Samsung SSDs. They're part of their T-series and they're USB-C based, and I really like them, but realistically, they're complete overkill for this build. But the reason I'm using them is I basically only use them right now to dump files on when I'm traveling. And so it's not a big deal for me to format them for these demos. And since they are SSDs, they don't require extra power supplies. The Raspberry Pi can actually power both of these just through the USB bus. But if you're buying spinning hard drives, you're gonna to have to buy them the desktop versions with power supplies because the Raspberry Pi is simply not gonna be able to put enough power over the USB bus to power spinning disks. So the Raspberry Pi 4 has two USB 3 ports, but if you use a USB bus, you can increase that. So if you'd like to use four or six hard drives in a RAID 10 array, you can actually get some pretty good performance and some huge storage for really cheap using those. All right, and so that's all the hardware we're gonna be running this Raspberry Pi NAS on. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so the first thing you're gonna to need to download is the Raspberry Pi Imager. Basically, that's how we're gonna be installing the Raspberry Pi Raspbian OS on our Raspberry Pi. If you already have the operating system installed on your Raspberry Pi, you can go ahead and skip this section. But if not, go ahead and download the Raspberry Pi Imager. I've left a link in the description. And then you're gonna to need to take your micro SD card and put it in your computer somehow. For me, I use this USB-C adapter. It's cheap and honestly not built the best, but it's got everything I need on here. The camera I shoot on has a CF card, so it's got a CF card reader, an SD card reader, and a micro SD card reader. So it's really got everything I need and it's really portable and just throws in my bag. So that, that's what I use for everything. So I'm just gonna go ahead and stick it in and plug it in my computer. All right, so now that the micro SD card is connected, we've got this Raspbian installer. So we're gonna go ahead and choose the OS, Raspbian, and we're gonna choose the SD card. And all we gotta do is click right. It's gonna ask for our password. 
And now it's going to go through and write this OS on there. All right, so now that Raspbian has finally been installed on the SD card, we need to do one more thing. And since the installer automatically ejected the SD card, go ahead and pull it out and plug it back in again to get your computer to remount it. All right, and so now as we can see right here, I've got this boot image. And so what we need to do within here is create a file named SSH. And the easiest way to do that in Mac is go to terminal, just right click on it and say open in terminal. And all we have to do is do it touch SSH. And so what that does is the touch SSH creates a file without any data in it named SSH in the folder. And the reason we need to do that is we want to enable SSH as soon as it boots up. That way we don't have to use the keyboard and mouse to enable it. Default out of the box for security reasons, Raspbian disables SSH. So we just enable it there. If you're using a PC, create a new text file called ssh.txt and then just delete the .txt from it. All right, and that's all we had to do. Just go ahead and put the SD card back in your Raspberry Pi and hook up power and an ethernet cable to your network and it'll go ahead and boot up. All right, so now we've given the Raspberry Pi enough time to boot up and so now we're gonna go ahead and SSH into it. Default out of the box, the Raspberry Pi creates a host name called raspberrypi.local. Think of a host name kind of like an IP address. You can type that in and it will connect to the Raspberry Pi, even though we've not set up the Raspberry Pi's IP address yet. So I'm going to SSH in using this host name. However, if this does not work for you, go ahead and log into your router and look at your devices and see which of them is the Raspberry Pi and use that IP address to SSH in. So if you're on a Mac, go ahead and open up Terminal. And if you're on PC, go ahead and open up PuTTY. We do SSH, and then Pi is the default username, at raspberrypi.local. And I forgot the Raspberry Pi. It's gonna give you a warning the first time, so just say yes. And so just type in the default password, which is raspberry. All right, so the very first thing we're gonna to need to do is change the password using sudo password. By typing sudo password, we change the root password. Now we're just gonna type password to change the user's password. So enter the current password, which is that raspberry, and your new password. All right, and so now we've updated both the passwords successfully. So I'll go ahead and just clear it and give us some space. All right, so the first thing we're gonna to need to do is first update, then upgrade all of our packages. The update basically figures out where to go on the web to get the new packages, and the upgrade actually goes through and upgrades your Raspberry Pi to the latest OS and all the packages within it. So we're gonna do sudo app get update. So that's updated our links, and so now we're gonna do a sudo app get upgrade. And this could take a little while. Say yes. All right, so now we've totally upgraded our Raspberry Pi. It takes a little while. For me, that probably took like 15 minutes, but now everything's up to date. And so that means we can install this with the least amount of worry. All right, so the way we're gonna be installing Open Media Vault on our Raspberry Pi is using a script from GitHub that this guy threw together. So basically, if you read through this install, it goes through and installs all the things you need for Open Media Vault. And I would recommend reading through anything you're gonna be running the first time, at least get a sense for it. Because you don't wanna be running things on your Raspberry Pi that you don't know about. All right, and so I went through and I found a few people who have talked about this script, and so I trust it relatively well. I went through and skimmed it and I didn't see anything too glaringly error, though it is definitely a security risk. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna copy this right here. And basically what it's gonna do is it's going to say, okay, go to this script on GitHub and run it as bash in root. And so all we're gonna do is copy that and paste it into terminal. And it's gonna go through and install everything for us. Now it is going to take quite a while 
but it's going to basically install all of Open Media Vault for us. And I promise this is the last long install. All right, so now it's installed and we've hooked up our hard drives and we're gonna go ahead and start it off by doing a quick sudo reboot. And then once this is done, go ahead and just connect back. All right, so now that we've done a reboot, we need to figure out what the IP address of our Raspberry Pi is by typing IP ADDR. And we're gonna look for this ethernet zero. That's that ethernet cable that's plugged in. And as we can see right here, the IP address is 192.168.1.64. All right, and so we're just gonna copy that and go to that address in a web browser. You might have to do an HTTP colon slash slash in front of it, depending on your browser. So as we can see here, I've done that, and it's gonna pop up asking us for a username and password. This is the web GUI for Open Media Vault that we've just installed. So first time login is admin, and then Open Media Vault is the password. All right, so the very first thing we gotta do is change that password. So go into general settings, and then we're just going to go up to web administrator password and make a new one because, well, quite frankly, that is no security. All right, and so now we should be able to log in with that new password. Now we're gonna go ahead and do a few key setups. So the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is change your date time to whatever it should be. And then more importantly, go into network because we're gonna to want to set up a static IP address. So under network and interfaces, we're going to add our device. We'll set up the ethernet and select that ethernet zero. And I would recommend setting up a static IP address here. You can either set up your router to give your Raspberry Pi a specified IP address, or you can have your Raspberry Pi request a static IP address. I always configure the static IP addresses on the device because it's just easier, but make sure that your router does not give this IP address away to another device. All right, and so I'm just gonna give it the 192. And then for NetMask, it's probably 255.255.255.0. And the gateway, put the IP address of your router. And just go ahead and click save. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and apply these. And it's gonna cause an issue because our IP address is gonna change from 192.168.1.68 to 192.168.130. All right, so it takes a minute, but basically go through and connect to the new IP address and give it five minutes or so, and all of a sudden it'll work. And so as you can see here, I'm now on 192.168.1.130. It's probably a weird cut there, but it took a lot longer than I thought it was going to. So log in with the password we just created. All right, and so the reason that we needed to make sure we had a stack IP address was that's how we're going to be mounting the drives that we're creating. We don't want the IP address of the Open Media Vault to be changing because then every time it changes, everyone has to change the new address to mount things. It's much easier just doing this statically. All right, and so now that we've logged in, let's go ahead and initialize our disks. So Open Media Vault is not going to let you, through the GUI, set up a RAID between two USB drives, unfortunately. They do this because it's very much a risk, because basically a single cable failure can cause a drive pool to crash, which is a lot more common with a USB drive. If you still want to create a RAID with these, even given the risk, you can still do it, just not through the Open Media Vault GUI. I've actually got a tutorial on how to set up a software RAID on a Raspberry Pi, and I'll post that in the description. But for this, I'm just gonna be doing JBob. So what I'm gonna do is go into Disks, and I'm gonna select SDA, and I'm gonna go ahead and wipe it. I'll just do a quick wipe. And it's already done. So now we're gonna go ahead and create a file system on there. So just go into file system and click create. Select the device, which is that device we just wiped and I'll name it big because it's the bigger of the SSDs. 
and I would highly recommend using ext4. All right, and so while it's initializing that file system, we're gonna go ahead and check our smart values. And unfortunately, since these are USB devices, we can't set off the smart tests, but the smart tests do get run by the drive itself based off of the USB controller and whatever the manufacturer has set up. So we're going to go to the devices, and if we select one and click information, and under attributes, we're gonna see all the values from the smart tests. So we can monitor these. So go ahead and click edit, and on both of them, click activate smart monitoring. This is going to monitor the tests and is going to notify us whenever there's a big change. So just do it for both and go ahead and just click apply and say yes. And so now it'll monitor all the smart attributes. And so if we go back into the file systems, hopefully it should be done by now. And now we can see the file system has successfully been initiated. Now, if you were creating your own software RAID, you would just see one device here and it would be MD0, but everything else should work the same. And so now that we've set up a file system, let's go ahead and add a user. So we've got the Pi already in there, so we can just use that to log in, or we can also add a new one. I'll give myself one. And then I'll just create a random password for this. And so now that we've got a user, we're gonna go ahead and enable SMB. I would recommend using an SMB server. It's by far the most compatible with Windows, Mac, and Linux. So under SMB, go into shares, and we're gonna add one. And under shared folder, hit this plus icon, and we're going to call it big, and then big. And this is just gonna go ahead and create the path to mount that folder and give it the permissions. And so we wanna make sure users have read write to it and just click save. And so now go through and set any of these settings you would like to. I like having a recycling bin. And then I set up anything after 30 days will be deleted from the recycling bin just so it doesn't go up. And just choose whatever options you'd like and click save. Now we're gonna to have to apply and it's gonna take a minute. And then we just need to go into settings and enable it and hit save. All right, and so now this should be all set up. In a Mac, go ahead and go to finder and just hit command K and type in SMB colon slash slash the IP address. On Windows, there are different ways to connect to SMB and those are really easy to Google though. Just hit connect. And right here, as you can see right there, we've successfully mounted it. So that means anybody on the network will be able to connect to that. Now there are a couple things you wanna set up, one being notifications. Set up this so that it will send you an email if there is a critical issue, but there's tons and tons and tons of stuff going on with Open Media Vault. So I'll let you dive into that however you need to. All right, and that's all I got for you. Hope this was helpful. Put any other tutorials you'd like to see me make in the comments below and have a good one, bye.